And now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Matt Lundgren. Uh, he's a Chief Data Science Officer at Microsoft Health and Life Sciences, and as Kurt mentioned before also, uh, also a former co-director of the uh, Amy Center and, uh, former, uh, and faculty at Stanford, and now an uh, adjunct professor at Stanford as well. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. This is, um, this is unbelievable. I've been uh, thinking about this day for a really long time. Um, back when Kurt and I, I think it was probably 2016, 2017, we sat in his office and we said, we should do a center. And you know, we should just focus it on interdisciplinary, no, you know, no guardrails with the traditional academic silos. We should break boundaries. We should reach across all the different departments. This is Stanford, after all, right? We can do some great things. And uh, little did I know that we'd end up here. We were always, uh, we had lots of ups and downs, but we were always really focused on having a vision and being flexible on the details to get there. And this is what's come of it. And um, I, one thing I did notice, so in that same meeting, Kurt and I said, we should probably have a logo, right? We, we got to come with something. Uh, so uh, two academic physicians coming up with something creative, not super awesome idea. Um, but we came up with a little thing that looked like a football and an eye, and no one understood what it was. We got endless questions about it. It was actually kind of annoying. And as you might see in your brochures, there's no, there's no logo in there. It's only a tiny little thing on your badges. If you look at that, very, very tiny thing, that's the logo that we came up with in his office uh, so many years ago. But listen, this is just uh, an unbelievable thing. I, I have to thank, uh, obviously, Kurt for all the mentorship and for joining me on this incredible journey. And then, obviously, Joanna for coming in as our first real hire and making this all possible. And, and your influence has been tremendous. You've been a force of change. And now with Serena, we have Nigam, we have Jacqueline, we have just such a great team. And all of you who have participated in this community, it just means so much to me personally. Um, it feels like a homecoming. So I'm really just thrilled to be here. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll get started with my remarks. So my talk is called More is Different, and hopefully it'll make some sense to you as we go through. And if not, you know, come ask me later. Um, this is my one disclosure slide, uh, just for the record. And this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about generative AI. What else, right? What else are we going to talk about, right? And so we're going to talk about kind of, you know, where are we? How did this start? Um, and then kind of bridge that into healthcare. Where is that impact going to happen in healthcare? And then kind of a, a, a message to say why you, should, why you should get started now if you haven't already. All right. So this was kind of the big bang moment, right? It's only been a year and a half. Hard to believe, right? It feels like it was decades ago at this point. Certainly, I feel it <laughs> in my roles. Um, but this was a huge moment. And, and then there's a lot of ways for me to show how impactful this was. I can show you all kinds of data on users and daily active users and the types of queries that people ask. But to me, this is the best way to, to show this information. Because if you look at that list of really popular applications, one thing should stand out to you. All of those other applications, as opposed to ChatGPT, they got a lot of dopamine hacking, right? There's a manipulative ads. There's ways to suck you in and kind of trap you into these apps. Believe me, I've had to delete TikTok like 10 times because can't, can't get enough. Um, but ChatGPT isn't, doesn't have any of that stuff, right? It's just a chat with an incredibly powerful technology, something that we've never seen. And whether you're 6, whether you're 96, whether you're you know, in, in industry, whether you're in academia, you're using this thing. It's just an incredible moment. I probably don't have to show this slide much longer, but I, I will show it to you just, just for the uh, sake of the record. But for a long time, I've been talking to audiences, tech audiences, uh, clinical audiences, right? And I often have folks raise their hand, hey, have you, know, have you used ChatGPT? Everyone raises their hand. And I say, keep your hands up if you use four. And almost all the hands would go down. I would be blown away. And I think when I think about it, I think it was actually the naming convention that's got people tripped up. Wait, 3.5 to 4. Doesn't sound like that big of a difference, right? I mean, my iPhone's probably updated 10 numbers, and I can't tell. But this is not a linear scale, right? This is a phase transition in capability. All of you that use 4 know that. And I, I actually say this is a logarithmic scale, so think of it that way. Uh, and, and to the point now where I, you know, I read an article, uh, I, I might look through a journal, and I see some study about LLMs. And if they're not using 4, I, I kind of don't take it super seriously. 
And I'm not sure that that message has, has gotten, but of course now with the, with the announcement a couple days ago, uh, that, should, that should change. All right, so early on, uh, I think anyone who used this thing for just even a minute recognized that there's some capabilities here that will be pretty useful for what we would call knowledge work, right? And the knowledge revolution, you've heard that before. But this is one of the first studies to kind of tease that out a little bit. They took 450 college-educated professionals. They randomized half of them. Here's GPT-4, this new thing. And go about your business, do your stuff, whether you're a coder, writing press releases, whatever you do. And let's see how you do in terms of time. And this has been repeated many, many, many times since then, but this is one of the first to really tease this out. You know, saving half of the time to do a task sounds pretty attractive. Um, but then the question comes up, you know, what was the quality, right? Because, you know, getting work done fast but sloppy doesn't really help anyone. And the quality went up. Now, if you tease out the sub-analyses, right, it was often people with a little bit less experience that did better, but nonetheless, on in aggregate, and we continue to see this, get their work done quicker and slightly better quality. And now, of course, there's been lots of different analysts that have looked at this at a, at a more of a macro scale. This is a survey done of, of 20,000 knowledge workers by Oliver Weinman. I don't put a lot of credit in that top line number stuff, but I do pay attention to this kind of thing. So folks that say 96% of people say, I think it's going to help me with my job. OK, it's a lot. Uh, on the other side, you see around half of them are already using it every week, at least, in their work. And then now this recent survey, which came out just a few months later, you've already seen that number double. Now we're at three and four people are using ChatGPT at work. And it's not that we're, we're just not talking about it. It's, isn't it strange? that everyone in this room is probably using it at work, but maybe they're not talking about it. Maybe they're not telling their boss that they're using it. You get these Reddit threads that talk, I'm getting a lot of time back. I'm, I'm walking my dog, I'm seeing a movie, I'm going to my kid's ball game. I'm not moving that deadline forward. I'm just gonna use ChatGPT to get it done. And this is my favorite example in, in, the, in the education world. Professor, this is actually a bunch of emails from a professor who said, listen, I know you guys are using it, I just want you to email me and I'll let you off the hook. And every single student emailed him right after making that announcement, right? So people are using this, but, but why aren't they talking about it? Well, we know why academics aren't talking about it because they're probably not supposed to be doing it, but yet we see the signs, right? So this is a study that was done just looking at some odd word frequency changes since ChatGPT launched. Isn't that curious, right? Suddenly we have all these different words that didn't pop up very often and they're all over the place now happened to coincide with the launch of ChatGPT. But on the other side, the people that are supposed to be reviewing those papers and writing some response, well, that same word frequency is curiously also increasing, right? So we're using this. It doesn't matter if you're an academic, a student, or someone you know, catching a nap at work. And of course, there's these blatant examples, which you know, I don't really know uh, whether that's an indictment on the peer review system or not, but people literally cutting and pasting, I mean, have a little bit more thought I would imagine someone could at least catch this, but, uh, but we do see examples of this as well. Um, so th this, is, uh, this has kind of raised something that we've uh, now been calling the secret cyborg. This was coined by Ethan Mollick, who I highly recommend you check out his book, Co-Intelligence, and uh, follow his blog. He's unbelievable. He's an uh, ec economist at University of Pennsylvania. And he calls this the secret cyborg phenomenon. And Salesforce recently did a survey of 14,000 uh, 14, knowledge workers, and they asked some really pointed questions about this phenomenon. Have you ever passed off generative AI work as your own? And would you consider maybe using it, not telling anybody and to say that you have skills that you don't have? <laughs> and these numbers are pretty healthy, right? These are people willing to admit it in a survey. Um, but this phenomenon is real. And uh, in kind of thinking about why is this, why is this a thing, um, I had to kind of go back to really old sociology literature. What would be the motivation to save time and not try to make more money, right? Because, I mean, it, it naturally you think, well, you know, you can earn more, you can do more work in a shorter amount of time, you can, you can earn more. And certainly there are examples of people doing it, doing it that way. But often people are actually looking for time. We're all looking for time. No one has enough. And if you go back to the sociology literature, we know this, right? We've known this for decades. Even if you have low economic security, your self-reported well-being is higher if you have time, over money. And when they do these studies and they look at people, they say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you some money. I want this group to spend it on activities that will save you time, hire, hire a house cleaner, hire someone to take your kids somewhere. 
And on the other, this other group, they said, well, you know, buy something that you've always wanted. And the people that saved some time were generally happier. And this has been repeated over and over again. And again, I'm not a sociologist. But this is generally, we, we know this intuitively. Like we, 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 we value our time. And if we're under time pressure, we're miserable. So OK, so let's think back at the survey and, and just take a look at another area, uh, this, this spot. So now we're talking about white collar workers who feel that their roles might become redundant. They're a little bit worried. Uh, and a lot of employees saying, hey, listen, I, I know this is going to impact me and my job. I've just told you that. But yet I, I'm not getting a lot of education. I'm not getting a lot of information from my employer. And so I'm, I'm a little confused. I'm a little nervous. And there's probably a lot of things that have come out over the years that have reason to make you nervous. This is one of the first papers that was done early on trying to say, OK, listen, this is a knowledge economy impactful thing. How will this actually play out? So folks from the University of Pennsylvania looked at various job roles, so many, too many to count. And they looked at them uh, under this axis they called exposure. And exposure for, for them meant that if about half of the things that you do every day could be made faster or more efficient by GPT-4, you're considered exposed. And so you can see some things on this list. I didn't put them all in here because it's already hard enough to read. But clinical data manager is one that definitely stood out for me because that's the one person in the hospital that everyone's trying to get a hold of and they're hiding under their desk. Please, I'm not pulling another cohort for you. Right? But now imagine that you can use, I can turn my natural query language into SQL. Okay? So you can see why folks might want to might do that. But this list, to me, says, OK, well, now, if these are the jobs that are exposed, which jobs aren't exposed? Right? And so that's, that's this list here. Hard to read, but, but I'll just highlight a couple. Uh, there's professional athletes, right? I don't have the genes, unfortunately. And now my kids who are looking for what they're going to do with their lives, they obviously don't have the genes because they're my kids. So uh, they're not going to be professional athletes. But then there's a lot of other things on this list that maybe you wouldn't go to college to do. Would you spend $250,000 for an education to do these things? I don't know. I don't think so. Dredge operators, slaughterhouse workers, wellhead pumpers, these are not things that we talk about very often. There's one thing on this list that I, I didn't know. It's called a roustabout. And I should have known because my dad's from Wyoming. Um, but if you don't know what a roustabout is, this is a roustabout. It's one of the most dangerous jobs on the planet, right up there with those crazy Alaskan fishing boat things. But they have no exposure to GPT-4. So, you know, obviously that was an analyst report. What is the reality of some of this? Well, we're starting to see it already, right? We're starting to get some signals that things are changing. Uh, this is just looking at freelance work, right? There's a decrease in the number of opportunities and also the amount that the opportunities pay. Uh, typically, writing jobs are down 30%. Software and coding, 20%. Core engineering jobs, 10%. And even Tyler Perry, if you don't take any financial advice from me, uh, take it from Tyler Perry, he's much more successful than I am. And even he, once he saw the text-to-video work from Sora, said, you know what, I'm not going to spend that money on that digital media studio after all. So it's having some real impact already, guys. And if, in case you think the academics are safe, I've got a minute for, for this too, <laughs> right? Because what people ask me all the time, they're like, hey, you're at Microsoft, you used to be at Stanford, you knew a lot of smart people. They didn't think I was smart, but they, they knew I knew smart people, right? And they said, why didn't we predict this? Like, who could have told us this was coming? And I said, no one knew. And if they tell you that they predicted this, either they work at OpenAI or they are lying to you, right? And to give you just a, a concrete fact here, so this is a book written by Michael Woodrich. He's a very famous computer scientist. Got some great uh, lectures on, on YouTube. Check him out. Uh, and he wrote this book in 2021, probably because he was at, you know, locked down in the pandemic. Who knows? But he said, listen, I'm going to write a book of everything about AI, like where we've been, where we're going, just put it all in there, everything I know. And in that book, there's this table. I love this table. And you can see that he lists some things that were kind of easy to do, some things that were pretty hard to do. And then right at the bottom, there's nowhere near solved, meaning that probably generations are going to have to have some new genius come along and figure this out. And you might recognize some of those things, right? Human level translation, writing interesting stories. Uh, interpreting a story and answering questions about it. That's normal to you now, right? Because you're all, you're all used to it. That, all those things were done in March 2023 with one model at the demo of OpenAI GPT-4. Pretty incredible stuff. I think we take this for granted already, as we do in our society. But this is pretty incredible. 
And now we're having conversations that are not uh, sarcastic <laughs> about general intelligence. Now, whether you believe that this is the technology that'll get us there or not, beside the point, we're still having these conversations. The types of conversations that would have gotten you thrown out of a CS conference three years ago. Okay, so where did this begin? And if you ask most people in the room, like, oh, you know, I heard about this thing, this paper, 2017, tension is all you need, the transformer. That's how it started. Okay, if you go back to the NeurIPS conference where this paper was, was first published, it didn't even make the number one paper. It didn't make the top three. None of us knew this was gonna be so transformative, right, at the time, but, but when you look back, you can paint this very nice narrative, hindsight's 2020, we can see some things that kind of started to pop up that we knew were gonna have an impact. But really, it's the scale. Certainly data, but definitely the scale. And a, and a lot of people, until they had a real good sense of what these scaling laws would look like, it was kind of a bet, right? They were taking a little bit of a risk. Why should I put this many uh, t flops into a, into a project that doesn't have a guarantee? What, what's the outcome? Are we just gonna do next word better? Right, but then now we find ourselves in this position where at scale, really cool and interesting things happen, as all you know. And whether you believe in the emergent behavior theory or not, whether you, you know, subscribe to the idea that the benchmarks were binary and it kind of just, that's why it looks like it jumped up so fast, or uh, you believe that they were actually predictable, doesn't change the fact that this happened and that we have things like in-context learning, chain of thought reasoning, but we also have some things that we didn't expect too uh, on, on the negative side. Things like sycophancy and manipulation. But all of this might be back, and if you go back to the 70s and you think about how we could have thought about this differently, you might talk to Philip Anderson. So he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist in the 70s, and in the mid 20th century at this time, there was a lot of academic posturing. There was, not that there's not now, but, but there's definitely a lot then. And, and there was this idea of the constructionalists and the reductionists. And the reductionist said, listen, I discovered a new fundamental particle of the universe. I am the supreme scientist because everything after that is details because I understand the fundamental pieces of the universe. And the people at the big systems level were like, no, 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 you can't predict things at the big scales from the little things, right? That, this was a back and forth. And so he wrote this paper as, as an argument and it's called More is Different. And he showed many different examples in economics, in biology, in, in physics, where we could understand the individual pieces really well, like for us, next word prediction. But at big scales, unpredictable behaviors happen. And I just love this analogy because this is exactly what we're seeing. And so when I talk to folks, and you know, Sri and I recently updated our Fundamentals of Machine Learning and Healthcare course uh, just a little while ago, and we, we, we try to get this concept really easy to package up. And this is how we kind of thought about it. We use AI a lot, it's almost lost its meaning, we say it so much. And a lot of us that have been doing this for a while say, okay, well, this is a narrow engineering thing. Like I have a use case, I have to be really picky about the use case I'm gonna to choose to automate, right? Because it's a lot of work. I gotta get the data, I gotta train the model, I gotta do all this work. And here we are now with these large models. It's almost like biology. Again, I look through this lens of biology and I think, well, listen, back when I was an undergrad and I was pipetting cells, I didn't build the cell but I was figuring out how it reacted to different things, how I could use it for X, Y, Z, right? So it feels like we now have this list of use cases that we used to fret and stress about. But now there's so many things on that use case list that I already have a model that can, that can do things for. It's a pretty exciting time. Uh, and so as we sort of shift our thinking, now it doesn't mean that we don't do the old way at all. It just means that we can take advantage of some of these large models. And this is my favorite sort of overall big picture. I don't know whether this is always gonna look like this, but for right now, this is how it feels. I think you all probably can resonate with this. Where we plan to be is a long ways away from where the technology is. And uh, I love this quote, there are two ways you can deal with exponential technology. You can either adopt it too early or too late. And as you can see, a lot of us are jumping in now. Okay, healthcare. Uh, you all saw Peter Lee yesterday, phenomenal book that he wrote. Uh, last year, I highly recommend you pick it up. Again, I make no, re no residuals from this book, but I recommend it to literally everyone. And so if you don't take away anything else from this talk, please pick this up. It's just such a wonderful introduction, very balanced discussion about the first contact, the moment that we all felt like, especially my, you know, I had this week of just existentialism, right? 
because it was just a, it was hard to believe the technology, your first time using it. And so it's kind of that experience, but through the lens of healthcare. Really great, really great book. And in that book, he kind of talks about how do we look at performance of these models in a healthcare setting? Well, one of the first things to do is to, well, we, we test doctors on all these really hard tests, so why don't we try that? And you can see this amazing jump between 3.5 and 4. By the way, all those scores are passing, uh, for what it's worth. And these, for the physicians in the room, you recognize this is not just a trivia test, right? These are, these are pretty tough questions. Um, and, and then over time, folks have started to use this as a benchmark for healthcare performance. Um, this MedQA, we kind of see these battles going back and forth about who's got 1% better on MedQA. Kind of in the background, physicians are like, well, that's not what I want to use it for, but okay, you know. Um, and you can see here, we've, with just some prompting, uh, and some, some techniques, not fine tuning, right? You can see that the performance of the base model, uh, this is the work by Eric Horvitz's uh, group called MedPrompt, does incredibly well, probably getting to the point where we're saturating this benchmark. But as Nigam likes to tell us, and of course we've had many discussions about this, is this the way we want to evaluate models in healthcare? Am I going to be using it for those? Probably not, right? Um, and, and despite that there tends to be a correlation between performance on this and the use case that you maybe want to use the model for uh, may not be the best judge. So Metaline, uh, kudos to Mike Pfeffer and, uh, and Nigam Shaw and others who put together some more useful benchmarks of things that we actually want to achieve in healthcare, right? So we can actually have a better common language as we think about what we want to do. But just, just think about the, the questions for a second. I'm going to walk you through. This is a, uh, an example out of Peter's book. I'm uh, shamelessly stealing his, his content here for a sec. But, so this is just a, a common question, right? You've all seen the step one, or if you haven't, uh, this, is, this is sort of what they look like. And you know, again, the model is going to get it right. We spend a lot of time actually interacting with the model about the question. So it wasn't just like, OK, you got the question right. OK, move on to the next. It was like, well, so what if someone picked a different answer? Why would they do that? Or can you change the question so that a different answer is correct? It just helped us feel the model out. Does it understand the concept? Is there a internal representation of this concept that actually is based in reality or just kind of parroting back questions. But again, this example, I think, takes it in a different direction. So someone thought to ask, what do you think the patient and the question is thinking and feeling? Right? Kind of an odd question if you're an NLP researcher, like this doesn't make any sense right, to do this. Um, but this very articulate answer kind of raises another very interesting concept. When you train these models with reinforcement learning with human feedback, what you're trying to do is you're trying to align it so that you don't get frustrated right, when you're using it. it, it, so, it so it feels like it gets you. And, and that's context. right? It understands kind of the gist of what you're asking. You're having a conversation. It's, it's context. And context is really close in the mind to empathy. right? You have to kind of acknowledge where someone's coming from. You have to understand. You have to acknowledge it just in words. right? And so when you see studies like this, this one, this one came from UCSD that looked at this idea of empathy. Now, you might uh, sort of quibble with me about the methodology of this study, but I still feel like the, 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 the baseline message is, is, is true. Where we see that the model is willing to spend a little extra time, certainly it might be more wordy, but it also is acknowledging it's, it's, it's getting you. It's getting you. Why would you ask that question? I'm sorry you're going through that, but here's my answer. Right? That feels empathetic. And because of this, because of this internal representation of medical concepts and this sense of empathy, people are using it. This is an example that went viral. Someone had a sick dog, um, went to a bunch of vets, spent a bunch of money, eventually just put all the data into GPT-4, and voila, got a great, great answer. Dog was cured. A little closer to home, uh, you probably have heard this. This has definitely made the news cycle. A uh, woman had a son, very sick, a lot of pain, went to many different doctors, finally got frustrated, put the data in GPT-4, and got a diagnosis of tethered cord syndrome. But for every great story, part of me in the back of my mind saying, ugh, this is not what the model's for. I'm a little nervous because things can go off the rails, right? Uh, this is not, it's not meant to be a medical device. And this is one of the chief reasons. There are many, but, but this, this, is the, this is the one that we all have, I think, when, when we think about a patient using these models to, to make a diagnosis for themselves. Hallucination. So this is a funny example that went viral uh, maybe a year and a half ago. This is three, you know, 3.5. Why should I put crushed, crushed porcelain in my, in my child's breast milk to help with their digestion? Sounds like a great idea, right? <laughs> uh, 
Um, and the model was happy to say, that's a great idea. Here's why. And it was wrong, but it was also confidently wrong. And that's what scares us, right? You can't be confident and wrong. That's a bad combination. So teasing this out a little bit more, this is a study of accuracy and confidence. So you can see on these easy medical questions in the different categories, confidence is in the dark circle, accuracy is in the light. And you can see, well, there's a little bit of separation here over, over on the left. And then you get to these difficult questions, and they're miles apart, right? Uh, very, very confident, super wrong. That's not safe. But that's not a large language model. This is a study of human physicians from 2013. This is teasing out the idea of sometimes wrong, never in doubt, right? We all know this, right? Um, and so when we think about how can we can change culture, we can change management, all these things we talk about all the time, uh, we recognize that people are kind of hard to change, but models aren't. They're actually not that hard to change. And as we learn more and more about how to teach these models to self-reflect, to have other models talk to other models, judge, judge the output, we put guardrails. We have lots of different techniques that we're using. And the good news is that it's not just a problem in healthcare. It's a problem across industries. We, no one wants this. And we're seeing this general trend towards solving some of these problems. And it's going to be a benefit for us as well. And of course, now you can see the results of that. You can put that same prompt into GPT-4. It's going to say, what are you doing? Don't put crushed porcelain to your child. What, it, that's crazy. Here's the reasons why it's a bad idea. And by the way, here's some things you should do. And I just you know, wanted to show some of this. I'm not going to be able to get into a lot of this. But, but just recognize, I think many of you in this room clearly do, but the model interactions, using these models, is not just about a one-to-one. -one, right? There's all these different techniques that you can use. And there's lots of work in each of those sub-disciplines. How do we use the model for a given purpose with these certain parameters? Well, there's lots of tools, and there's more coming. So you can get this sense that there's this almost spectrum, this continuum. How does it work for your use case? How sure do you have to be? OK, let's, let's think about some other tools that we can use to use these models. So why would we want to use this in healthcare? <laughs> right? All this seems like a, it seems like a lot. Um, and if you talk to any physician, any nurse, any healthcare professional, they'll tell you. They are ready to leave the medical system. They're done. They're done with all the extra paperwork. They're done with all the hassle. It's not what they dreamed of doing when they, when they enrolled in either nursing school, medical school, or others. And again, if those of you who are physicians, you know this. You can't give me pizza. You can't give me yoga days. It's not going to fix it. There, there's, a fundamental, there's a fundamental problem in our system that we need to address. And if you really tease this out a little bit more, it's kind of obvious, right? So this was a survey done by Becker's. Imagine someone going to med school, spending all those years of training to take care of patients, and then they're spending 15 hours a week doing paperwork, things that aren't patient care necessarily. It wouldn't take you very long to say, well, where's that exit door? Because I'm, I'm, I'm done. And obviously, there's many, many papers I can show you about EHR time and uh, responding to inbox messages, all these little paper cuts that you miss your kid's soccer game for, that you might have to, hey, honey, I'm missing dinner. I'm going to be late. And when I look at what we can potentially tackle, given what I just showed you about the technology today, this, this chart always comes to mind. This is an old chart. But I would still be willing to wager that that purple line hasn't gone down in the last 10 years. We're spending so much money on administrative work in our healthcare system. And I just talked to you about a technology that really is good at knowledge work. And are these low risk, high value use cases? And, and I bet you there's a bunch in there. I know there's a bunch in there. And if you look at what the potential size of this opportunity might be, it's huge. It's almost incomprehensibly large. And so if I'm going to be spending my time working with these technologies and trying to accomplish something, can I focus there? And can I get a, a, a big win? And I, can I solve some of these burnout, burnout problems for physicians? So this is all in the context of something else that's going to happen to all of us. right? I get to use a lot of these tools, which is kind of cool. But we're in the co-pilot era. Right? That means in your daily life, you're going to walk around. You're going to have a co-pilot for your Word, your Outlook, your Teams, your Excel your PowerPoint, right? You're going to have co-pilots. You're going to get an intuition. This thing's saving me some time. I'm pretty efficient. And then you're going to go into healthcare, and you're going to be like, where is my co-pilot? Right? It's going to happen. We're all going to feel that gap widen. I still have a fax machine in my office at work. So there already is a gap. But, but this, is, this is going to be a bigger gap. And so you know, the one thing I'll mention, we have spent a lot of time on this problem. A lot of people have. 
And this is this idea of an ambient note generation solution. There's a lot of these. And the fundamental thought is, can I divorce the doc from having to sit at the computer and hurriedly type a note while they're trying to see their patient? Patients don't like it, docs don't like it. And so can we just record a conversation, take that transcript, put it in a note, let the doctor edit and sign it? Sounds really simple, but it's not. Think about the last time you visited your doctor, right? You probably talked about your cousin's wedding, your next vacation. You said, I think I'm on 50 milligrams. No, wait, hold on. I'm on 20 milligrams. And then all that gets recorded. So imagine the NLP days of trying to, how do you tease out, what, what model has the understanding of context to figure that out, to understand the medical terms, to understand the double back, who's speaking? Generative AI is really helping us here. Uh, and obviously you've seen the work that, that Microsoft is doing with Epic as strategic partners where uh, the opportunity to embed co-pilot experiences in the uh, systems of record that we use every day this is a huge opportunity, right? Uh, I can think of a lot of things on my list that I'm doing in my EMR that could be made more efficient. But it, it's not that it's not gonna get solved by just a few players in the field, right? There are so many, I go to hospitals all over the country and everyone has a list. <laughs> Everyone's used ChatGPT and they come to you with a list. Here's all the things I wanna do with this, right? And there's this huge, huge list that grow and grow and grow. And so you kind of have to funnel them down. You, have to, you do have to prioritize, right? And there's some basic things that you can think about as, as you do that. And, um, and there's a lot more to this, but you're starting to see that, that, that the interaction where we started with, that portal into a technology that no one's ever seen before, is generating a general experience and intuition of where this could be useful. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to see. I'm just gonna show two examples, uh, just because they're a little bit like, I would not, not have thought of that. Uh, but there's so many, I could spend literally the whole day on this. But uh, this one was uh, by an organization that said, listen, we've got a problem. We've got a lot of note bloat. Note bloat, if you don't know what that is, it's like uh, a really long note that just has probably a lot of cut and paste in there, not a ton of new information. And it actually hurts patient care. So there's a, there's a metric that folks like to use from a safety and quality perspective to say, we have to get our notes under control. So this organization actually came up with the guidelines they actually built a, a, a narrow model. To, that was how important it was to them. They built a narrow model. And then they actually had physicians that were going around spending their time talking to other physicians. Say, hey, uh, can you get a handle on that note? Here's some best practices. I've noticed that your notes are pretty big. We got to get a handle on that, right? Imagine the inefficiencies. Imagine the feeling of burnout and frustration. Now you're getting your notes down. Now you got someone hassling you about your note quality. Or you're the physician doing the hassling. You're, you know, no one wants to be that person. So can we use GPT-4 for that? And the answer is, well, of course we can. We can show GPT-4 the guidelines that you've come up with for your best practices and have it review the notes and give pointers, give suggestions. Think about the time savings here. This isn't something that you would have thought about. Most people are thinking, well, I want to make a diagnosis with these bots. Why not things like this? Another one I like a lot is clinical trial matching. So again, another very manual process. This is a, billions of dollars are riding on the line for filling these trials. Most trials don't fill. There are thousands of trials at any given moment. As a physician, I know that I'm seeing patients that probably would qualify. I just don't have time to keep up with all the inclusion exclusion criteria, what trials starting, what trials ending, what, you know, all that stuff. So we hire people to do that. We have a lot of people that do that. And this institution said, well, why don't we see how humans do versus GPT-4 in that same sort of pre-screening task. Look at the inclusion exclusion criteria. They actually use retrieval augmented generation here. And then go through, these, go through these charts and then find those patients. And by the way, how much does it cost at the end of the day? 10 cents a patient. Pretty incredible stuff. And again, this is not, I'm putting a model out in the world to uh, be a diagnosis bot, right? This, these are really important problems that particularly if you work closely with healthcare, you can start to identify. But, you know, of course, everything's not perfect. There's limitations. Those limitations won't always be there. This field is moving very quickly. Uh, I focus a lot on a couple of these things. But nonetheless, it's fair to say that we still have some work to do in the healthcare arena. And it's really, really important we get this right because uh, we recognize that, yes, we do a lot of things in text. I just showed you lots of examples of that. But there's a lot more information on the table, right? We all know that. To understand a patient's health and disease state, you have to have more information to do this the right way. And so how are we going to teach these models to go beyond just text? Not that it's not, that it's not useful, 
but we need to learn these other modalities. And the good news is, uh, as it happens, these models are very flexible. If I can tokenize, I can patch things up, I can make it bite size, these architectures are pretty flexible with different modalities, right? And so what do I have in my institution that's unstructured? Well, clearly text, right? But look at all these other things. This is, the, this is actually where the majority of the data gravity sits. Most of the information about you is not in text. It's locked up in pixel data. It's locked up in genomic data. How do we unlock that? And of course, I'm, you know, shout out to, to Nigam uh, and, and his team, but this is, the, this is the North Star. We need to get real world data at scale into foundation models. It, now, we do need to solve the compute challenges, right? We do need to solve some of the ways that we do this. But at the end of the day, how are we going to unlock the data? And how are we going to unlock it in a way that doesn't just come from two populations in this country? That's the question that I pose to all of you. Because as much great work as we did at Stanford, and we're very proud of it, it's, we can't just be us that makes data available. Right? Not every patient in the world looks like a patient that came from the Bay Area. Right? How do we fix that? And I'm really excited to talk about this, hopefully more. This is the teaser for the fireside. Um, we'll talk about more about this topic and, and some others. But at the end of the day, just I'm going to leave you with this. This exponential feeling, this feeling of a little bit uneasiness, it's hard to keep up. I think there's another way to reframe that. I think you should reframe it as an opportunity. This is a really, really important moment for all of us. And all of you in this room are in positions to really make a dent in what could be a really promising future. So thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to have the fireside. Appreciate it. So I think you know we can spend this time. I have a few follow-up questions okay. after seeing your your talk, and I think people in this room as well. You can you know think about uh, if you have any questions for Matt. Um, we'll take some uh, audience questions as well. Um, so uh, so Matt, I guess I have to start by following up on your you know. Uh, your, your comment towards the end about the importance of unlocking data. So, you know, you've obviously done a lot of pioneering work in, in this field. Um, I think there's a lot of people here in the audience as well who have the potential to contribute to that. So, uh, what are any, how, how do you think we can do that? What are any suggestions or I mean, advice that you have? Great question. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you know, like we have, and, and Kurt's published about this quite a bit too, this is this idea of what are the incentive structures, what is the infrastructure that we need to help hospitals make, make it possible to share data? And, and you know, even if it's just for research use, even if it's de-identified research use, this is still important. Um, in fact, I, you know, people come up to me, random, random conferences and things, and it's like, oh, I use the, the Chexpert labeling system, and I use this data, I'm like, we just kind of came up with that. Like, we didn't expect it to be used by the whole world, right? We probably would have thought maybe about a couple of other things um, with our metrics. But, but nonetheless, you see the impact that just even a small effort like this can have on the, on the world. And it, I've been racking my brain about this for a long time. And I think for, uh, for us, we do have a precedent. So if all of you are familiar with the, I doubt you would be, 1984 law that made it so that every hospital, this was, this was a law that was actually created so that we could have more organ donation and tissue donation. And the way this law works is it says, listen, if you want to participate in Medicare, CMS, you need as a hospital, every time you have a patient that might be dying or is died, is, has died, you need to contact what's called an organ procurement organization. It's a nonprofit that gets set up. There's all these regions across the country. This exists today for decades. And that process basically is that the hospital then is calling up this OPO. The OPO then reviews the medical data, checks to see if they've you know, checked off the donor on their license. And then if, they, if they're eligible, they'll reach out to the family themselves, have that conversation very, obviously they're very well trained to have that conversation, very difficult conversation. And in that process, they kind of run the show from there. So they get all the medical data about that patient, they get the information, they acquire the tissue, and et cetera. They either go through organ donation, tissue donation, or both. This is, this is every day, every state. What I see in this is a potential infrastructure that would allow for, in that conversation, just imagine you go to the DMV, and you always have to check that box, right? Am I going to be a donor? There's 170 million donors in this country. 
only three out of 100,000 are really eligible for all the types of organs that you would imagine can save somebody's life. So it's really not common. But yet, what if there was another box that you could check that said, I'll, I'm willing to donate my de-identified medical records after I pass away. I don't need them, right? My family probably doesn't need them. But could it actually contribute to the public good? I might argue it might. And so in that case, is there a way that we can structure the law? Can we set up an infrastructure? We have ARPA-H, we have NIH. We have all these little pieces that I'm seeing on this playing field. And there's really just one change in, in, in the regulation. It's literally to say there's organs, tissues, and data. Now imagine you have these 170 million people that are willing to also donate their data. This is exabytes of data. And this isn't just one region. This isn't just one state. This is nationally. And again, the infrastructure, the permissions to access data, to use it, it's kind of already sort of there. Anyway, this is my fantasy that we can maybe make this happen. Um, and again, there's probably, just like we had all these challenges doing this um, when we first started out, you know, my crazy idea um, that I almost got fired for at some point. Um, but here we are, right? Look at the benefits that having de-identified data responsibly available for research. Look at all that we've learned. And what could we do now that we know that we need more diverse data in the world? I think that sounds like a really you know, compelling and, and exciting idea, Matt. And I guess, how, who do you think are the major players that need to be involved to make that happen? How can we actually get there? Much more important people than me, I can tell you that. Um, we, would, we would need large efforts. We would need people to educate. We would need people to lobby on our behalf. We would need people to structure the legislation. I'm looking at institutions like HI, like Amy, like Stanford itself to really kind of champion this and, and show the benefits, as we've all seen today, of making data available in the first place. And then mm -hmm. the pitfalls of that, where we've seen that most of the research, most of these AI developments, have not been on diverse populations. It's a problem. We know it's a problem, right? And then you have these kind of odd incentive structures where folks are having to buy data. There's data brokers. It just doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. It feels like we need to think about this system. And is this not for the public good? Um, and I'd argue it is, right? And so, again, I don't, I'm sure the, there's probably someone who's a, a you know, legal expert in, in the room that's going to say, oh, this, this is really complicated. I don't know whether there's any complication that would, that would make me not want to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I think hopefully you know, this symposium here is bringing together so many people from different backgrounds all related to AI and health that you know, maybe, uh, uh, maybe some of you starting from here can actually uh, contribute to or thinking through some of the parts of this. But I hope so. Sounds like a very, Count on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, a very, very exciting idea. Um, OK, so, uh, so then maybe I actually want to follow up to you. You also mentioned this you know, sort of uh, how, do we, how do we really take advantage of this opportunity and you know, do things both not too, uh, be, they're not too early and not too late. Um, and, uh, and, and so you talked about some of these you know, high value, lower risk areas that uh, I think you know, will be really transformative in the next few years. I'm curious your thoughts about the sort of higher risk areas like you know, diagnostics and you know, tr uh, treatment plans and things like that. Do you think that's something that the next you know, I don't know, GPT-5, 6 <laughs> or similar models will, will just solve? Do you think it's something where uh, a lot of it is about you know, how, uh, uh, how do we figure out new ways to interact with these imperfect systems? What are your thoughts on how do we, how do, we do this um, progress along this curve right? Yeah, it, and, and I liked how you framed that because it is funny. Like every time I, okay, that looks like it's a kind of a little harder every time those sorts of things come up. There's so, by the way, there's so much low-hanging fruit that it's almost impossible to satiate really with all the opportunities. But let's just say we are going to chase this hard thing. You have this weight calculation in your head. You're like, I could put a lot of work into making this right, or I could just wait for the next thing because the bitter lesson keeps you know, coming up and sweeping mm -hmm. us, right? And, and I, I know that those of you who are in the investment community, those of you in the startup community, this is probably a constant thing on your mind, thinking about what do I tackle that would give me enough room to not get swept up by another model that off the shelf can, can do it. And so the way I look at the weight calculation, and if you're familiar with this, this is like that classic thing where you think about, uh, the, well, the weight calculation came from the idea of I'm gonna send, I'm gonna send a, uh, let's say the world's ending, I wanna send a, the, the last remaining humans to a far distant planet. It's gonna take, you know, lifetimes. With my current technology, meaning that my engines, my rocket fuel, the, my, what I understand about physics, it's, it's gonna take, let's just say, generations. 
Or I could hang on, hang on for a bit, wait for the technology to get better. And if I did, maybe they figure out how to break speed of light or go the speed of light. Now that group that you send a generation later actually gets there before, before the ones you sent. Right? So that's that weight calculation. And so you know, Ethan Mollick actually talks about this. And, and I, the reason I like this as a foil for thinking about this problem is unlike that whole thing where I've set this thing in motion and I can't change it because now it's in space, the models can swap them out. Right? If you have a really important use case, take advantage of the plan for the next model to be better. So take that, you know, you have a list of things you might want to accomplish. A couple of things are kind of hard. Maybe you can just hang in there because you can swap out the model. And now all of a sudden it's, but you're ready for it, right? You've already started to sow the, sow the ground for that particular use case to be effective in whatever workflow. So I, I feel like it's a little bit more optimistic than having just to hang out and wait. Um, there's, as you all know, there is a, still a ton of work, even if the model was amazing at the use case, the last mile is still the last mile. How do you get it in the system? How do you educate people to use it correctly? All those problems don't go away because the model works super well, right? Um, and so doing that kind of work, I think, is still valuable, even if you're kind of crossing your fingers hoping the next model is going to take care of it for you. Uh, I, I, yeah, I really like that, that point about planning both for the, the now uh, as well as simultaneously for what's going to happen with um, future, you know, future model improvements. Um, you know, I'll, uh, I know we probably have some audience questions. Let me ask you one more thing. Okay. Uh, and you know, I, I think um, I think actually one thing that's you know done so much amazing work both in academia and now in uh, in industry. I think it's a you know it's a not a common path no. you know, going through being a physician, physician researcher in academia to now your role in industry. Um, I'm I'm just curious if you know any. To hear a little bit more about your personal journey of how you got there, and and also I know there's a lot of physicians in the audience as well. And uh, if you have any comments for anyone thinking about you know similar sorts of paths, I mean I get asked this a lot because um, I think at some level you can look at like you know you, in retrospect you can paint a narrative of how your career went. You're like oh logically I was going to do this and logically I'm going to do. That's not how it works, guys. I mean at least for me like I, it was literally not planned in advance. Almost any of some of, you know, most of these moves. In fact, I, even just coming to Stanford was not planned for me. I, it was Sam Gambier, the late, great Sam Gambier, who we all love and miss, uh, you know, really had to make a case for why I could, why someone like me, who had no real research uh, chops, I was certainly not a Stanford level uh, researcher, why, no why would I be <laughs> successful sure. here, right? I mean, honestly, like, that was a hard thing. I did not predict that I would be successful in any way, frankly, here. And then the same thing with like AI. I'm an English major. What am I doing talking to people in the Gates building? You know, I should be over writing poetry on the lawn, right? So like, there's just, <laughs> there's just these moments where you're just like, is, does it interest? So I, again, I think for me, it's impact first, almost at all costs. If, if you can do something with impact, you gotta do it, right? We have no time in, in, this, in this life. And then there's, and then there's learning. So can you learn a new skill? Can it make you more you know, useful? Can you do more things with it? The final thing is earning money for me. That's how I, so that's my priority list. So if you can check all those boxes, you go with it, right, clearly. But, but impact over almost all else for me, just because I, I just, as I get older, right, I start to feel like there's just not that much time left. And, and so if I'm not doing something that brings meaning to me or my life or to other people's lives, I maybe shouldn't be doing it. And so using that kind of as a guide, I'm not saying it's going to work for everyone. I'm not sure it worked for me necessarily, but that's how I think of things when I'm presented with an opportunity to say, would you want to do this? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, so I want to open it up to some audience questions. Uh, let's start here. It's not working. You can just shout. Yeah, I can be loud. Uh, next to the microphone, so I guess I'll be oh, the... Oh, go. here we go. Now it's started. Uh, Ali Abayazid, I'm a neuroradiologist. I'm also a graduate student at the Masters of Clinical Informatics and Healthcare Management here at Stanford. So, um, Matt, uh, of course, as usual, excellent talk. Thank you uh, for the information and uh, the vision. Um, I, I'm personally uh, very concerned about large language model, and sorry if that's the first question, but uh, it's more toward the <laughs> bias and equity, 
Uh, so I wanted to get your input on, on the fact that given how these models were kind of trained, that they kind of give you more of the internet mean of information, uh, and they're not specifically trained on healthcare domain data. Uh, so it's the trust thing that, as a healthcare professional, a professional I'm concerned about. The other thing is equity. Um, so we actually, so I was surprised about the 10 cent per patient because we did some um, research into the cost of APIs for a healthcare system, and we were um, surprised that it could range anywhere from a million to a 50 million dollar just on API cost per year, depending on how much they use it for their EHR. So um, on the equity piece, the ability to access this kind of technology is going to be reserved for uh, the rich and famous, so to speak, when it comes to healthcare applications. Maybe 65, 70% of the healthcare system will not be able to pay for that. Um, so if we can just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, okay. no, these are really important points. I, I think there's a few things in there. First of all is the equity of, like, the equity and bias in the model itself. Like, basically the bias, as you pointed out, trained on the internet. Internet's not always a great place. Um, and, and again, this is not just the problem in healthcare, this is a problem across the board. So you're right, we do need real world healthcare data. Right? We, can't, we can't continue to rely. So, so that's one of the reasons I think I'm so emphatic about real world healthcare data at scale, but across the board, not just, again, from a few places. But the other bias you mentioned is just like, are we biasing to the institutions that can afford to use these models? I think that's absolutely an important point. In fact, everyone is thinking so where it used to be in the narrow way, you think, oh, okay, well, a lot of investment, a lot of data, a lot of work to get to that use case. Now it's like, what's my cost and latency trade-offs? And the good news is there are a ton, as you know, of open source models, of smaller models, of uh, work going on in a sort of a model ecosystem. And you may have seen the work uh, called uh, Frugal GPT, if you've heard this, but, but it, it, the, the basic thing is, can I start with a small model and get a sense of the, the, the general, and then can I, then I maybe escalate to large models for, for certain. So you can start to get to ecosystems of models that can get that in a better place. And frankly, as you have recently seen from every subsequent announcement, it seems like the cost is going down. That will, I believe, continue to happen, such that almost in that weight calculation, well, I, I can't do this use case because it needs to be hap happening at scale, and I can't make a small model for it, so I'm just gonna have to wait for the cost to come to a place where it's, it, it's, it's useful. But the democratization, I think, I, I push back just a little bit because, again, on Monday, now, you know, that everyone can access a GPT-4 level model today for free is insane to me. Like, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable moment. And knowing how powerful these models are, knowing how useful they are, I'm really excited that maybe we're actually, maybe more than any other time in the history of AI, more people are able to interact, use, and build with these, with these systems. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that all the points you raise, they're super big problems, and they're not just healthcare problems. They're everyone's problems. And if we don't have these interdisciplinary folks working together to build these use cases and work together in the domain, we are going to go off the rail. I mean, right, you know that. Um, you know that inherently. So these multidisciplinary settings are more important than ever. And this is where Amy's, the Amy Center, I think, really is, is setting the tone for, for that conversation. Of course. Thank you for an excellent presentation. One comment and one question. If you want to save a third of a healthcare cost of 30%, go to a one pair system. Don't put a band aid and streamline administrative costs when you can eliminate many of them by going to a one payer system. Works in Europe, should work here. Second, I'm very concerned about the quality of the data that goes in your models. Uh, you created, you meaning the AI community, uh, created the term hallucination. Uh, you, that has a real meaning to doctors, not the way you use it. But get away from that. There were two problems, one, giving wrong answers, and two, giving fictitious references. I wonder how you corrected the second problem. Uh, do your models take into account the quality of the publications. When I use the model, I will get uh, references that are fictitious. I will get references to advertisements, as well as references to reputable papers. 
if I know the answer, I don't use the system to get the answer. And if I don't know the answer, then I have to check the validity of it. So can you address the quality of the data issue? Yeah, I, I don't, yes. So the, the point you're bringing up, as you know, if you use the Bing Copilot, uh, you, you sort of see that you're able to, to, to link to and to check the source for yourself, right? I mean, that's clearly something that a lot of folks are, are doing. And I certainly can't speak on behalf of the, the folks that are developing those applications. But in healthcare, it's super important, right? I don't want it to reference old guidelines, right? And so we use retrieval augmented generation. We are able to update those guidelines to have it reference those and then show me where you got that. And so when you, when you look at some of the products that uh, you know, draft a note, where in that conversation did, did that come up? Maybe I don't remember that from you know, uh, a few minutes ago kind of thing. At least in oncology, on our guidelines, we have evidence-based decisions, and we cite the level of evidence, and we cite the studies. And so that data is available. I, I'm concerned as we see more and more papers retracted. Mm -hmm. Does your model take into account a paper that was retracted last week? How up-to-date are your models, et cetera? So I'm a little concerned about uh, doctors using these models without understanding their potential harm and limitations. It seems to me this is a product that's being sold, and as was discussed yesterday, uh, where's the regulation? And who's going to do the regulation? Is the fox going to take care of the chicken coop? I don't think so. Yeah, great points. And, and like I said, I think we've, we've, you know, one of the points that you're raising is about education, if I'm you know, sort of reading into that a little bit. And, uh, you know, that's where, you know, Shuri and I spend a lot, many hours uh, working on that problem, right? We, how can you learn about the principles, the pitfalls, without having to learn to code first? And I think it's more possible than ever now. So getting that intuition. There's no user manual, right, as you as you're kind of pointing out. And so having that intuition, I think, is really important. You clearly have a, an intuition of, hey, I think this isn't going to be right. I need to double check that. That's that intuition that everyone should have, frankly. Thank you. Welcome. So I'm going to be reading a few questions from the online. Uh, so there's lots of questions, but three key interesting ones. One is um, speaking of ambient health and um, using of recording uh, patient converse and clinician conversation, if clinicians are expected to record entire conversations and keep them in the cloud, how are we going to manage the cost uh, for cloud storage? Um, question two is, wouldn't multiple LLMs create new data solutions? How do we solve this problem? And question three speaks to 35% of physicians will reach retirement uh, age in five years, and only less than 5% of acceptance rate in, in U.S. med schools. Could Gen AI help expand medical schools? Wow. <laughs> I, I knew I would get hard questions, but this is, uh, this is okay. And Matt, to make it harder, we're close to the end of our time, so <laughs> we we're trying to do the... <laughs> oh, do we have to... Oh, sorry, we're out of time. I'm going to have to answer the... No, no. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, which one would be the quickest thing? The last one, in terms of educa medical education, I would like to see more opportunities for uh, the pre-med to be supercharged so that the med school experience is definitely more of the third and fourth year experience, literally on the rounds, and, and, and moving the, the first two years maybe into, into some of the pre-med programming. I, that may give us an opportunity to expand opportunities. That's the best I can come up with, so yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Matt. I know I, there's uh, many other questions. Hopefully, Matt will hang around for a few oh, more yeah. minutes afterwards for those of you who have questions for him. We could talk for hours with Matt. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much again thank for you. your wonderful talk and, and discussion. And with that, we'll uh, hand it over to... Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah.